it may have the same appearance. You know, one, both of them hold a knife. <laughs> Who's, so one's consciousness is completely different to the other. Right? One's consciousness is to help the person, the other's is to kill the person. So it's not that we stop acting. Often we, we think that here is it merged in that. By controlling the ever-disturbing senses, or, or from restraining from the senses, generally we have this idea that we have to go into the forest and you know become a monk and 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 live like a live, live like some guy just you know goes and does nothing and he just meditates. But I'm forty eight. What's it? Not too forty. One has to act in this world. One ha is required to act because he has to maintain his body like we're speaking. So one does that, but he does everything with according to the desires of the Supreme. The reason that we suffer, the reason that we we experience this this miseries in the world is that we're simply just trying to take everything for ourselves. But ultimately, this is meant for the satisfaction of Krishna. Because you see, our real nature is just to serve or to be, become real servants. And so when we understand this nature of ourselves, and we understand that we're, we're, we're actually, we're not um, the center of the universe. We're not, we're not the enjoyers. Although we're trying to enjoy, we're suffering all the time. Why? Because we're not actually understanding who we actually are and our relationship with the Supreme Person. Got it. That relationship is not an ordinary relationship. It's not a relationship of give and take. It's a relationship that is unconditional. It's a relationship that is about love. It's nothing to do with fear that if you don't do this for me, you're going to go to hell. No. That is the point of the Bhagavad Gita. That Krishna, he gives this knowledge that Arjuna, why does he give this knowledge? Because Arjuna inquires. Krishna doesn't speak for the sake of speaking. That is not Vedic knowledge. In Vedic knowledge, if you read our books over here, you see any book that you read, it's all based on inquiry. On relevant inquiry. So Arjuna is inquiring from Krishna. And Krishna is telling him and how one should act. How one should act. The real yoga means to concentrate the mind upon the Supreme Person of God. This is real yoga. Yoga means to be fully conscious of who is, who is the Supreme. Who is Krishna. And so when we have this consciousness, one, his activities that he performs, it may be the same activities. Just like I'm speaking, everyone speaks. But I'm not speaking some material thing. I'm not speaking something so you can go and become a big businessman and ha have the best enjoyment and become a big car dealer or, or, or a big superstar. This is all temporary things. We're speaking something that of material nature. So yes, speaking is that a lot of people would think monks don't talk. Right? We, this is one thing, the conception is that monks don't talk. We don't talk that which is materialistic. Or we talk which is that which is spiritual. See, just because um, this is a conception, this is a wrong conception. Is that just because something material causes a particular um, uh, product to occur? Just like if we try to, our desires often cause us suffering. That does not mean that we should have no desire. Right? Just like if one wants to become a positive, if he's a negative person, he wants to be positive. That doesn't mean you become a neutral person. You go and hang out with positive people and become a positive person. So just like that, it's not that just because all these things, our activities that cause us suffering, we stop actively. No, we use that same activity but with a completely different consciousness. A consciousness of giving enjoyment to the Supreme. And when we do that, when we understand this key fact, when we become servants, when we understand our position, we are satisfied completely. Why? Because when we're acting in accordance with the Supreme, when we're not doing something for our, just for ourselves, we're also not attached to the results. And this is what Krishna is saying here, that gain or victory are Krishna's concerns. So we're acting, our activities in the world, when we go to work, or when we perform um, any sort of work, we're in consciousness of Krishna that, oh, I'll go to work and I'll earn some money. And, and, in, and I'll use this money in Krishna in order to facilitate people to come and hear and, and listen to, to spiritual knowledge. I'll, I'll, I'll purchase books and give it to people. 
I'll use my job like this in Christian service. This is how one, this is real yoga. Yoga does not mean, oh, who's that? Mm. <laughs> um, so yoga does not mean sitting there and closing our eyes and trying to focus on nothing, but yoga means actually acting. This is practical. We cannot stop acting because that is the nature of the soul, it, it, that it wants to act, it has desires, it has feelings, it has all these things. So one just has to purify them by acting on a higher level of consciousness, which is called Krishna consciousness. So any activity that we do, we just direct it towards Krishna. And we become happy, because we're satisfied, because we're not attached to the results. That whatever may happen, I'm acting for Krishna. So if that result doesn't come out great, no problem. It's okay, it wasn't for me. It was for Krishna, and that, that's what Krishna is that. So that's why Arjuna, he isn't a, he isn't a battlefield, he's fighting. He's fighting his own kings, his own, his own family on the other side. You guys read a little bit about me. But, um, it's it's going to take me a while to explain, but I'll, I'll go on. So you can, you can see that Krishna, Arjuna, he's fighting even against his own family. So what Krishna tells him, you act in yoga. Why? Because whether success or failure, you won't be disappointed either way. You remain very steady. And in success or failure, we don't divert from serving the Supreme. That is because the success and failure may be also temporary. That's the thing, that's just the nature of the world. That we, we suffer and we, we gain happiness and stuff. But we understand that we're higher than that. We're on a higher platform than that. So, so one has to understand this point, that we are, we, are, we are not the center of the universe. We're actually the uh, servants of Krishna. So, like this, this point that when one acts for Krishna, that that just like we go, anybody like a banker here? No. A banker. So, if you go to the bank, there's a person who takes your money, and then he gives you more money back. So this person, he worked there all day. He probably like over time like handled like millions and millions of dollars. But whether he loses the money or he gains the money. He's not happy, or he's not distressed. Why? Because he's acting on behalf of the bank. He's not acting for himself. It's not his money. Right? But he's, he's performing his duty. He's doing what he's being told to do. So here, or in our own lives, or Arjuna's, Arjuna's situation, Krishna is advising Arjuna. He's explained all this thing that you're not the body, that this family and this thing, this is temporary things. So you act in according to your duty, what needs to be done in order uh, for the necessities of life. Like just like we need to eat, we need to maintain a family, we need to do such things. So we can do that, we can go on doing that. But just act in, be mindful of Krishna, be in conscious of Krishna. And this is the goal of human life, to be constantly meditating upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so when one does that, one actually becomes happy. One starts to uncover his uh, real self. One actually starts to uncover all these coverings that we have, that I'm black, I'm white, I'm American, I'm a part of this community, I'm a part of this group, that group, this family, that family. One slowly starts to understand that, oh, these are temporary. All this, it doesn't mean that we start to see our families, oh, anyways, you're just, you're just another family, uh, uh, you're not really real, it's just temporary, what's up? No. We still act, we still have certain affection for family, but we know that this is temporary. Just like we know that the car that we're driving, you know, we're not the car, and we have nothing to do with the car, it's just we're getting one, from one place to another. But we act accordingly. So, so this is there, that, that one, one simply just dis discharges his duty. Right? It's just like a bank, it's just transactions. But he remains equal with he, he, he goes on with life like this. And so, here, we can go on, and so, this is one's real nature. And, and this, the, the, the soul is covered by these conceptions, by false ego, by identifying oneself of different things, that, like I was saying, black and white. And so this causes us to actually forget who we are. And this causes us to just run about trying to find happiness in different places. And so, coming to that platform of self-realization, is only possible in human life because, like I said, we can inquire. And so one acts in Krishna consciousness like this. And so this, this is called 
yoga stuff that acting in spiritual consciousness we can see in the in the in the translation yoga is the equal place but it also means um, acting in spiritual consciousness and so one must perform his duties like this that whatever one may do in the world that he goes on acting in such ways was what some of us may really be engineers doctors so we can all apply Krishna consciousness somehow or other. this is a prayer factor for us so Krishna is explaining this to Arjuna and so Arjuna, he questions Krishna very uh, elaborately throughout the whole Bhagavad Gita. He asks many questions, and Krishna gives very um, uh, detailed answers about such things. And Krishna does not at any time force Arjuna to force the knowledge upon Arjuna. This is real love between the Supreme and the, and the, and the individual. That we have a loving re re reciprocation. That is our real position. And when we understand that, that our loving re reciprocation, our loving relationship means not of that, you know, I get something out of you and you get something out of me, that it is actually out of choice. That one loves someone out of choice. If, if there's no choice, you have to put a gun to your head and say, love me, is that love? That's often the thing in, in, in religion we find, that if you don't love God, you go to hell. But is that love or is that fear? So if something is based on fear, it doesn't have that same, you know, that, that, that same uh, acquired uh, result. It, it is actually, it, 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 it doesn't satisfy the, the spiritual self, because that is what the, the self is designed. It's ultimately designed a relationship with Krishna. He is designed to serve someone who, who is the most attractive. Krishna literally means all attractive. That is the most beautiful. And, and he's young. God is not old. And does anybody want to be an old man here? Does anybody want to have bad knees and a big gray beard and, 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 a, and a headache all the time? No. You know, nobody wants to be old. We're all we're all youthful by by spiritual nature. So God is youthful. He's actually said he always looks like a 16, 15, 16 year old boy. Generally, when we're 15, 16, that's when it's like, that's like 16, that around that area, that's when, you know, everyone looks the most beautiful, uh, looks the most, you know, fortune, their skin is perfect and fine. And so, so, God is not this old man that sits in a chair and looks like He wants a loving relationship with, with, the, with the individuals, with each individual, he has a loving relationship with each individual. And this is not like the material world. It's not like, you know, there's this one really good looking guy or a girl and everyone fights for them and, and that somebody may get a little bit, somebody may not get a little bit. And so everyone has to fight for the, for the position. It's like a rat's race. Whoever gets the first or whoever's the best. But no, this is not like this in spiritual life. That Krishna is unlimited. And, and he can have unlimited individual relationship with each single one of us. That we are not in this rat race in spiritual consciousness. We are all understanding on this platform that we're all serving of Krishna. And when we understand this, we can also have loving relationships among each other because we're situated on the platform of spiritual consciousness, on the spiritual platform. So Krishna, he doesn't force anything upon us that we have an individual choice. We have a choice whether we want to love Krishna or we want to turn away from Krishna. So Krishna tells Arjuna this at the end. He explains all this philosophy. He says, the supreme goal of life is to understand me. But, Arjuna, you do what you like. I've explained everything to you. You can do what you like. You're not forced to act in any way at all. You do what you like, but if you choose to act contrarily, you may suffer in certain ways because you're acting now because you know his his understanding spiritual self. But if you start acting on the material on the on the on the opposite on the material platform, of course you'll suffer. So he tells him, so you do what you like. So this is this is real love. That one gets choice. By choice we can have real love. So so one has to actually carry out this this process by actually understanding and, and going through and actually inquiring and coming to the platform of, of loving Krishna. Yeah. That one understands not just by faith, but by real intelligence. That we don't expect anyone to be like, yes. That's it, and just I say some words, and everyone gets enthusiastic, and then, but there's no real understanding of anything. 
We must understand what is matter, what is spirit, what is the nature of God, what is the nature of, uh, of the material world. What is the nature? This is real inquiry. This is really going into understanding the supreme, understanding what is our real position. And so I'll finish up with this last section here. Um, the Prabhupada has mentioned a few things. Arjuna is a Kshatriya and such is participating, participating in the Varanasham Dharma institution. It is said in Vishnu Purana that in the Varanasham Dharma, a whole aim is to satisfy Vishnu. No one should satisfy himself as in the ruler of the, in, as is the rule in the material world, but one should satisfy Krishna. So unless one satisfied Krishna, one cannot correctly observe the principles of Varanasham Dharma. Lyrically, Arjuna was advised to act as Krishna taught him. So, in general, in Vedic society, we have what's called Varnashram Dharma. This is just like, it's, it's, it's present everywhere in society. Just like you have a class of, of teachers, you have a class of workers, you have a class of, um, you know, the rulers, like politicians. And so, so all these classes are there also in Vedic society. And so, um, Arjuna, he's a fighter. And so his primary duty is to fight. And so he, he is situated in that in that institution. But this is also a material dedication. Until one actually understands that I'm situated in this body, I have to do certain duties that may be fit for my body. Just like if one is a painter, naturally, when somebody's born, does any anybody have a kid that's like a natural painter? No. Anyway, some of us may be born and we can do some things very naturally without having to think so much. Without having to even learn it. You know, somebody may go to the art school for six, seven, eight years, but the kid at three years old, he can draw so much better than that person. So natural um, natures are given to us. When we when we're coming when we come into the world, there's certain natures that we all have. Some of us can have very strong bodies, just like him over there. Uh, and some of us don't. We're skinny. You know, some of us are able to run very fast. Some of us, some of us, are, some of us are very slow. So, in Vedic society, they recognize these natures that everyone has a different nature. So, if that kid who is born and he can naturally paint at three years old, he's throughout his life he's engaged in painting. He's very satisfied. Why? Because he doesn't waste his time trying to learn all these things. He's situated in that, he can paint, he makes everyone else happy because he's so good at it. He makes himself happy and he saves time, most of all. And so everyone has their particular nature. Somebody can do this, somebody can do that. And everybody understands that. And everyone is happy in doing that as long everyone's happy is doing that because when one is doing certain activities that one is really good at, he saves a lot of time. And that time that is saved is used for self-realization. Often in the world, we're, we're taught from a young age to try to be the best. Try to do something that is not even of our nature. Uh, you have to like, you, you, you may be born uh, like in India or Nepal or wherever, and most of the Eastern, uh, that when you're born from a young age, you become a doctor. Uh, this is generally, I'm sure one of us, some of our boys, you, know, you become a doctor or an engineer. If you don't become those two things, then uh, you're a disgrace to the family. <laughs> this is general understanding. Or in the Western society that you have to be the best, you have to be the top of the thing, you have to be a great superstar, you have to be the best rapper, you have to be the best basketball player, you have to be the such and such. Although we may not have nature, somebody may be very short, but he wants to be a basketball player. Is he going to be a basketball player? Maybe Muggsy Bogues. <laughs> <laughs> but you see that we try so hard, if you're, if you're short and you have to, you want to play basketball in the NBA, you spend a lot of time trying to practice, and you may not even get there. So you waste a lot of time. You're just wasting human form of life. But he may be good at many other things. And so if he just engages in that, and be, just be satisfied with what he has, he'll actually be happy. And he can engage in spiritual activity. And so this Varnashram Dharma, when one is satisfied with what he has with the material body, what he can do with his body, what, to his capacity, one doesn't need to go beyond that. Because all we need to maintain the body is to eat some food, make sure we have a place to sleep, you know? And, and, and basically that's the necessities of the body, eating and sleeping. So, and, and have some clothes, you know, make sure. Um, so, uh, so this is a, just as long as one satisfies the base necessities of the body, that is all we need. 
And then rest of the things, rest of the time, we just spend on actually understanding self-realization. This is the point of this Varnashram Dharma. That is so important. This was the whole system of society that was there in India. Right? So that there would be these different levels of people. There would be the teachers, there would be the politicians, there would be the people who work in the farms, who are the farmers, there would be the people who work, like build houses and such and such. And so these people, they were engaged in their particular activity. And they were, they were all very good at what they did. And they had time, so they would spend that time in understanding the self, realizing the self. So this is what we all must do, that we, we, we try to save as much as time and spend that time in chanting this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And this man, Maha Mantra that we chanted before is, is, is a mantra that can take one to the ultimate goal of life. That this, is the, this is a spiritual mantra, you won't get bored with it. It's not like chanting Coca-Cola. I watched this video a long time ago. There was this guy called Mr. Beast on YouTube, and he just like does crazy things. Like he chanted Justin Bieber's name for 18 hours straight. <laughs> yeah, huh? He looked like he was going crazy. <laughs> so one can chant Justin Bieber, Justin Bieber, or Coca Cola, Coca Cola, but all these things are material. They all have a saturation point. Or whether it's sex, whether it's whether it's eating ice cream. Uh, they all have a saturation point. At some point, who, who likes ice cream? Right, most of people. Right? <laughs> I'll give you like, what's the best ice cream you like? I don't know much ice cream. In Jenny's ice cream. Jenny's ice cream. So if I give you like 15 tubs of Jenny's ice cream, will you have it? Uh, that would be a lot. That's <laughs> right? <laughs> so we all have this saturation point. But this Maha Mantra, because it's of a spiritual nature, it doesn't have such things. It is of an eternal nature. It is ever blissful. So it, it is going to give you unlimited happiness. We chant this all day, every day. We're not bored. You guys, in, anyways, in a big, see how you guys like to dance, right? So we're going to dance, and we do this every day, and we start at 4.30 in the morning. How many people you guys know that like to dance, sing and dance at 4.30 in the morning? I know. You know, you know I know. Oh, he knows that. Okay, that's how he knows the philosophy. <laughs> I was like <at> 6. <laughs> so... So this, this, this Maha Mantra is actually by the process of which we can deliver the mind, which we can deliver ourselves, which we can engage in spiritual activity. And so it actually is a process in this particular time, is, it, it, it elevates one fastest to the spiritual platform. And so you guys can all chant this Maha Mantra and, and, and become really happy. You know, the, the symptom of happiness, symptom of love is that one sings and dances. You guys did that when you were like in teenagers, like you, you really love a girl, so you start, and then, or you, you find something, you really feel happy, and you start singing in the shower or something, you're dancing. So, this right here is this Maha Mantra, we're always singing and dancing. And we're in love. This is, this is, we're actually acquiring love for the Supreme. And you can practically experience that. This is not, a, this is not something that, uh, you know, a faith where you just believe and that's it. No. You guys do it, and if you don't experience it, you call us liars, you call us cheaters, whatever. But you do it properly according to how it's been described. You follow the process, because if someone gives you instructions, like if you're doing a science, if you're in a science lab and you're performing experiments, uh, and, the, and the teacher gives you certain, certain instructions, and you don't follow that, you do your own thing, and the results are different, and you criticize the teacher. <laughs> Is that right? No. So once you chant this Maha Mantra, but once you do it according to uh, how it's been taught, because that is how this process, this is how we still have the knowledge as it is. We, we haven't changed it because we have the text as it is. And we extend it, that's why this Bhagavad Gita called, is called as it is. Because it has not been changed and we're following the process, that is why we're experiencing spiritual bliss. That is why we're understanding our spiritual nature. Anyways, I've gone a little over time. So we can have questions, um, if anybody has questions or comments. Anything. I feel like a lot of people answered questions and things that have to do with If you guys have any questions, everything's clear. Things. Oh. Yeah. yeah, there's a very nice class. Very, mm -hmm. very comprehensive. But I have one uh, request. If you could make the connection between 
if I'm a great painter, or if I have a fancy to cook, or maybe even be an engineer or a soldier, like our junk. So what's the difference between just separating your spiritual activities and being able to make those activities from material to spiritual? Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That was explained throughout the class also. Mm -hmm. Is that one simply just changes the consciousness of that. I'm doing this for me. Um, sorry. Um, is one simply changes this from that this is for me to this is for Krishna. Mm -hmm. That is the consciousness, that change of consciousness that's required. So one may paint, one may be a great painter, but he doesn't paint just for the satisfaction. He may paint great um, pictures, just like that one over there. That's a great picture, that's a great painting. So that painting is done for Krishna. That not only satisfies Krishna, but it also satisfies the self. So simply, where if one is an engineer, he may make money. So like I was saying, he utilizes that money in Krishna's service. Or he may build a great house like this, you know, to facilitate spiritual activity. If one is a doctor, he may come and he may help the devotees. He may help the people who are serving the spiritual, who are serving in the spiritual um, way. Then he may fix their bodies and help them in certain ways, give them medication, whatever it needs, because the body goes through certain stages. So you can spiritualize your activities like this. That, that, you know, whatever you're doing, you just turn it into Krishna consciousness. This is practical. You don't have to go in the forest and live like a, a monk, or you don't have to become a monk. The key point is that we become Krishna consciousness. Krishna conscious. Is that okay? Anything else? We'll go to her first and then we'll come to you. Bear with me. Um, I have a toddler. Mm. She's a liar. And it's time for school and conformity. And I was one of those children that was very easy going to conform. But she's not that. And I don't want to take away from her all that she is. You know, you have to rear kids. You're supposed to, you know, don't straighten the arrow and go a certain way. And uh, even in the school system, she's different. She's, she's, she's very different from her peers. And I don't want to cause her suffering by trying to make her conform, mm -hmm. but at the same time she has to live. Yeah. In her so how do you um, get help taking away that intrinsic nature that, that she has? It's amazing, but it's not the same. Uh, everybody else seems to live out the same. Yeah, we all have different natures. And so you, you, have, you act according to your nature. So she, she may have a nature of maybe being, you know, she, she may have a lot of energy more than others or whatever. So you can use that in certain ways. Uh, ultimately, one has to use it in self-realization to actually have real effect, just to, in order to have real happiness, so in order to actually understand who I Because even this this understanding of nature, or we, we may have certain natures, but still, that is not our real self. So that is not actually who she is, you know? But that is, Certain, certain symptoms of her, uh, we like to say karma, that, that, of, that, that, that's come about like that. So she may be acting in those ways, so you have to redirect those activities so that they can be used for the ultimate good. Right? So, so you, you, you may want to constrain it in certain ways so it's not harmful for a person. Just like a doctor prescribes um, certain medicines and what not to take and what to take for certain people. So one actually has to know that, that you know by by actually studying and understanding what is right and what is wrong, what is action and what is inaction, what one should do and what one shouldn't do. So first one has to understand that because until we have to be able to distinguish, this is one key point, we have to be able to distinguish between what is real and what is illusion. So until we can do that, we can't actually help anyone. So, so we may sometimes, she may have a certain nature, but that nature may be harmful to her in the future. So you may even have to change that for her ultimate good. So she may like may like to dance and sing and jump and we can bring her here. We like to dance, we like to jump, we like to sing. So, so you may have to um, constrain some ways in order for the ultimate good of someone. Just like I was saying the doctor, he prescribes certain medicines, what to take, what not to take.